Welcome to the fourth day of the 18th Vermont Organics Recycling Summit. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont, and we organize the summit in partnership with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. This year's summit is being held as a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts this coming Sunday. And it's the largest and most comprehensive education initiative of the composting industry. And the theme this year is Compost Nature's Climate Champion. And I wanna just give a shout out to this poster here on the right. This is by a University of Vermont student from Dr. Deb Nair's Composting Ecology and Management class. And uh, every year they have, they, they create their own posters for International Compost Awareness Week. And we have the full gallery of them on the CAV website at compostingvermont.org forward slash VORS. And when you go to the gallery on our web page, on that web page, if you click on the individual images, you can actually see the student's name and read about their inspiration and what they were thinking when they created the poster. So this has been a really fun collaboration with UVM students that we've had going for the last handful of years now. And I just really like to highlight um, highlight their work and, and their thinking about, about these issues and topics. I also, of course, wanna give huge thanks to all of our sponsors and exhibitors. These are the folks who allow us to put on this week long program and make the entire virtual program free of charge. So really lowering the barrier of access for folks, allowing us to share the sessions far and wide without their support, we really couldn't do it. This year, um, the, our sponsors and exhibitors include Community Bank, Eco Products, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies, Casella, Food Cycler, Nature Cycle, Vermont Natural Ag Products, Viably, CV Compost, the Vermont Produce Program from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and Woods and Laboratories. So uh, please join me in giving them a huge round of thanks for their continued support of the summit in Vermont. And so uh, to, here we are today, Thursday, May 2nd. This is the Optimizing On-Farm Composting Tailored Support for Sustainable Success Session. Andrew Carpenter is a certified soil scientist, certified crop advisor, and certified nutrient management planning specialist. Andrew has been recycling organic residuals and developing recycling programs for materials that have not historically been reused since 1992. He has extensive experience in research, planning, and handling technical issues related to the reuse of organic residuals. He received a master's in plant and soil and environmental science at the University of Maine, and he founded Northern Tilth LLC, an environmental consulting firm focusing on organic waste management and building soil health in 2023. Andrew is also the current, uh, currently a trustee for the Compost Research and Education Foundation. And with that, Andrew, please take it away. Thanks. Uh, so do, do you see the full screen? We sure do, yep. Okay. I just a, a minor correction. It, no, I started yeah. Northern Tilt in 2003, not 2023. I say that because oh. I want you to have the idea that awesome. I'm a successful business person. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see if I can. Okay, yeah, so um, we're, um, we are an environmental um, consulting firm, but we really do specialize in organic waste management. Um, we are what are called, one of the things we do is we're technical service providers for farmers working on the, um, working with the NRCS. And we've also undertaken a few grants um, projects through the NRCS. These are called conservation innovation grants. And essentially the NRCS, their, um, their goal is to protect soil, um, water and air resources um, in both forestry and farming. And they do this through the process that they have practices that they know in one form or the other can help protect some of those resources. And they offer cost share to farmers to implement those practices when there's a resource concern that's been defined. Um, the conservation innovation grants are very specific. They are essentially trying out new practices to see if they are something that the NRCS may take on in time if they're effective. So this current grant is with the Connecticut uh, NRCS um, and it's working with six farms 
um, that have on-farm compost unit operations. And the idea is to provide technical assistance to those farms to see if we can improve the composting operations on the farm. The idea being, or if this was a successful project, um, we would be able to demonstrate that by providing some extra technical assistance to farms that are already composting, we can actually help them meet their composting goals. And also more importantly for the NRCS, help protect natural resources, typically in terms of water runoff and, and soil erosion. So um, that, that's the sort of the, the basis for the grant. Part of the reason we went after this grant is because we do a lot of nutrient management planning on farms throughout New England. And we've found that um, while a lot of people have on-farm composting operations, a lot of them are running in really suboptimal conditions or, or just aren't meeting their goals for composting. So I just quickly want to go over um, fate of organic matter transformations in soil because I do always like to start with this. We have this magical process of photosynthesis where we collect, um, have the ability, plants have the ability to collect carbon dioxide um, and water um, and solar energy and transform that into uh, simple organic compounds and then more complex organic compounds and actually build biomass and life. Um, and ultimately, that biomass, a lot of it ends up on the soil or in the soil in one form or another. We poop, um, plants die, we die, things go back, they hit the soil. Um, and when fresh organic matter comes into contact with soil, which we know has billions of microbes in every gram of soil, those microbes get very excited because the organic carbon bonds in that fresh organic matter are a source of energy for them. They drive, uh, um, they, they drive microbial oxidation and they're also a, a form of food for the, the microbes. So they love that fresh organic matter comes, builds their biomass, builds their community. Um, in the process, they're taking in some of the both carbon, nitrogen, other elements from that fresh organic matter. Um, and they're also ultimately forming what we used to call soil humus, now essentially stable uh, soil carbon in that process. And that's the, that, that's the stuff that we're really going after that, that is the, the basis for good soil health is that recalcitrant soil carbon that, that adds um, soil aggregation. It helps with water holding capacity. It helps with erosion resistance. It's a long-term pool of soil nutrients. Uh, it's the long-term sort of more mature soil organic matter. In that process, typically about of that organic carbon that's in that fresh organic matter, and this is just a rule of thumb, about two thirds of it goes off into the atmosphere. It's uh, carbon dioxide, just in the first decade or so after it's added to soil. The remaining third is in the form typically of, of microbial biomass or that more stable soil organic matter. Um, so this is important. It's essentially we have this natural pump. We're losing two thirds of it, but a third of it, at least in the short term, is staying in the soil profile. So we have sort of a natural pump of carbon from the atmosphere into soil. Um, going to talk a little bit about different processing of organic waste. As a company, we work with all kinds of materials and, and all kinds of processing of organic waste. For some materials, direct land application without any processing prior to um, it hitting the soil is, is completely appropriate. For some, composting is much better. For liquid waste, liquid organic waste, or more moist materials, anaerobic digestion is often a good way to go. And we have been working a little bit with pyrolysis of, of different organic materials as well. Ultimately, for these first three, land application, compost, and anaerobic digestion, that, that carbon cycle is going to be the same. You're going to end up from that, if you, if you think of that fresh organic matter that's either going directly to the land or going to composting or going to anaerobic digestion, in the end, after that material is added to the soil, we're going to end up with that, a similar carbon balance. About two-thirds of it will go off into the atmosphere, and at least in that first decade or so, about a third of it will remain. In land application, when you don't process the material first, those transformations happen in the soil. When you compost it, you're doing that. You're engineering what's going to happen in the soil um, in a composting pile. Um, and you're trying to do that really quickly, 
but essentially it's the same thing that's going to happen after you add fre that if you added that fresh organic matter to soil and anaerobic digestion you can think of as somewhere in between um, that's where in, in anaerobic digestion you, you put that material in a, a reactor essentially that's devoid of oxygen and a lot of that organic carbon gets especially the readily available organic carbon that break, would break, otherwise break down quickly in a compost pile or after land application gets transformed to methane, but you still have the sort of more resistant carbon left in that digest state, which then can be applied to the soil. <clears throat> so one of the things that I find uh, fascinating is what the goals of farmers are to compost material, because in a lot of cases, composting might not necessarily be a good fit for them, but they also have a lot of different um, uh, scenarios in which composting might work for them, and they're not the same at all from farm to farm. In some cases, it's managing a wet material um, that for one reason or the other might be hard to handle, hard to land apply, and I'm not talking about liquids at this point, but I'm talking about manures that are still almost slurry-like. In some cases, uh, we have a lot of beef operations that do it simply because they have a lot of waste uh, hay in their um, manure, and it's hard to spread with a typical um, spreader. And so composting it for a short period of time breaks up that hay and makes it easier to spread. In a lot of farms, we, we work with really big farms as well as the smallest farms around. Um, we work with organic and conventional farms, but uh, all farms, all livestock operations deal with some mortalities, natural mortalities on the farm for bigger operations. This is a bigger issue. And in a lot of cases, a lot of the composting operations that we deal with are simply for managing mortalities on the farm. It's, it's typically the best way to go for managing mortalities. Um, in some cases, it's the reduction using composting to get those thermophilic temperatures to kill the microbes. Um, some of the pathogens that might be uh, harmful to human health or might get picked up in vegetables or, or run off into water bodies. Um, and in some cases, it's actually the farm is generating a material that's high enough, that has a high enough carbon to nitrogen ratio, that if you directly applied that material without composting it, you'd actually tie up nitrogen in soil. And then finally, there are some of these on-farm composting operations that are there in sort of a, a, maybe a, what we might think of as a more traditional sense of composting. They're composting to produce a really high-end uh, quality compost that they can sell and it's actually a little bit of a revenue stream for the farm and they might even get into bagging. But all of this, this entire range is what we see on on-farm composting operations. So we have, <clears throat> in this case, we looked at uh, we're working with six farms. The, the project is actually almost wrapped up um, in it, that had various experience with composting, some of them very far along, some of them had never done it before, um, to try and help meet what their composting goals were. Um, the first one was the beef operation. They had just... Um, gotten funding and built with NRCS funding a really nice bedded pack um, for um, the beef operation. And typically the, the way bedded packs are constructed these days, especially by NRCS, is they will have a portion of that, um, that barn that is a traditional bedded pack where you're building up the bedding all winter long. And so it might get to be three or four feet high. You're adding bedding uh, continuously over the um, winter, and then you're scraping that out. Um, and that's and that is sometimes can be a great compost feedstock. But the, what we're looking at here is the the remaining manure, which is in the feed alley, um, which is scraped typically on a daily, sometimes weekly basis in these um, uh, bedded packs. And then in this case, the NRCF built these bins at the far end of the pack with the idea that the farm would compost the um, scrapings, the feed alley manure in, in these bins. So what we found out right off the bat is, um, and we've seen this, it's not happening as much anymore, but the NRCS was funding composting operations and they built bins as if they were for aerated static pile, but they wouldn't have any aeration. 
essentially it's just not going to compost there you're doing you're, you're basically creating really bad conditions for composting because you're surrounded by on three sides by concrete so you're not feeding any air into it without an aeration system there's not that much that's going to happen biologically in these bins um the so it would it, so and that was the case they weren't really composting they were heating up a little bit um it would be a big operation and, and a bigger expense than this farm was willing to put in to provide aeration to essentially drill holes in the back here have blowers and blow and a plenum and, and blow air through here it's also the case that in this and we find this a lot some farms just think composting is the way to go because they know composting is a great thing from my perspective it, it, it didn't make any sense um, to compost this material. It's a great source of nutrients. He was not selling the material. He's got plenty of hayland without great fertility. Composting, in my opinion, was not a good fit here anyway. Um, I want to talk about that because I think it's important. There are, um, to make the distinction between when composting is good and when composting isn't good. If we look at, from a nutrient balance perspective, in manures, we typically have um, if you look at plant available nitrogen and phosphorus in manure, you typically have almost twice as much plant available phosphorus as you do night plant available nitrogen. Um, when you compost and, and plants typically take up twice as much, um, nitrogen as they do phosphorus. So you have a, a natural imbalance here. And this is why nutrient management planning has even come into play because with over um, decades when people are applying uh, manures to get the amount of nitrogen they need for crop uptake, because nitrogen tends to be the most expensive and rate limiting nutrient, you're overdoing it with phosphorus. If you compost this material, phosphorus is conserved in the process. It doesn't go away, it's not transformed, it stays there. The nitrogen, on the other hand, you lose some of it and a lot of it becomes less plant available. So essentially you exacerbate that nitrogen to phosphorus imbalance when you compost material. So if you have a material that has plant available nitrogen that doesn't have too high a C to N ratio and you need the nutrients, um, this, and they can displace commercial fertilizers that you would otherwise buy, direct land application of that manure is often a much better choice than composting. And so in this case, it was pretty clear that the, those bins are, it's nothing composting in them. And for to meet that farmer's goal, makes more sense just to simply land apply that um, manure on its land base than to actually compost it. The second was it, it basically a state-of-the-art aerated static pile system that the NRCS did pay for, um, for a horse operation. Um, it's a training facility and, and boarding facility. So they generate, you know, for not such a big farm, they actually generate pretty big, um, uh, you know, a substantial amount of, of heavily bedded horse manure. Um, <clears throat> so the goal, their goal was simply to better manage the manure. They also were not into it to, to make a high value product. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, I, I haven't seen this before. I, I thought it was great that the NRCS actually constructed a covered aerated static pile facility. It's not something that they typically do. Uh, so it's a good operation. The problem we found, we did find some problems. So essentially from beginning to end, they were not, that material was not getting composted. You can see this is actually the compost, the storage bin in the end, and it hasn't changed all that much since the beginning. And there were a few things going on. One is it was the only input was the heavily bedded horse manure. Carbon to nitrogen ratio in that material was pretty high. Second was, and this is something we I don't usually see in New England, the material was too dry. Um, it, usually a cover is, is a great thing to have on a composting operation in New England because it's so easy for those materials to get wet. But with this feedstock, essentially the the um, the, the composting mass was too dry. The, the moisture content was too low. Um, their aeration system, they didn't get any technical assistance on that. And it was only set to go on 
when the compost piles got to be 160 degrees or higher. It did not pulse. Um, so we ended up um, shifting some things around so that they were actually um, pulsing the air. Um, their uh, aeration piping was clogged. We often got clogged with water. They had, in, in, this is an interesting thing to me too. They were they had been adding water with a sprinkler system um, after starting the piles. And what we found was it was the piles got sort of hydrophobic. So instead of absorbing that moisture, it it, it actually ran off the piles and created a little bit more of a mess. What we had them do was actually add moisture at the beginning of the process. Um, before they, they started the aeration to try and get it into the piles more, we got them pulsing the, um, the aerator. Um, so it was, it was time to go on and off. Uh, I think it was about two minutes per hour, something like that. And then um, we actually had them experiment with adding some more nitrogen at the beginning. So they did get more effective composting. One thing that was interesting with this well, was, while this was sort of the Cadillac, um, operation they're not that interested in composting and they're essentially selling this finished material which isn't quite finished uh, at a very very low per yard cost to a contractor that's using it in um, top soil that doesn't care too much about it i actually think um and i hate to say it they are composting more effectively but in some ways this is a good storage bin and maybe a little pre-treatment but the, the, what, they're, what they're making is still like a great input for somebody else's larger composting facility that needs some more carbon because, and there are a lot of facilities like that. So we were able to improve the composting conditions here considerably. Um, <clears throat> the third farm, and I, I love it, we did really have a wide variety, is a traditional piggery in Southern New England that's been around for um, generations that got started as a piggery picking up field food scraps from around the community. It's sort of a traditional um, setup. And they um, got into composting. They um, essentially compost not only the pig manure, but some of the, the food scraps that are a little bit flopped that don't end up being the feed. And they get uh, leaf and yard waste from around the area that's in the uh, New London area. So they have a good source of carbon there. There, um, and they also had a really, as you can imagine, it's a larger, um, well, compared to other areas in New England, it's a little bit larger urban area, better demographic for selling compost than say up in, in Northern Maine. Um, so they had developed a pretty good market for it. Um, but what we found was they're essentially composting on the front end, uh, the front face of this, and they're getting good temperatures at the beginning, but ultimately that ends up getting covered as they move out this way and then they harvest from the back. And so it wasn't as thoroughly composted as it should be. And the big thing with this is um, because it, uh, I mean, all manure before being used on vegetables or sold into landscaping or you know potentially into gardens, um, needs to go through the process of, of killing pathogens. And that's, you know, keeping it above 131 degrees for at least five days in an aerated static pile or 15 days uh, when you're turning windrows. While they were getting those temperatures for a little while up front, um, I wasn't convinced that they were getting them thoroughly. And for um, pig manure, it's even more of an issue than say, uh, horse manure, dairy manure, because pigs have really similar gut biota to humans. So the trans, the, there's the more potential for transfer of, of pathogens from pig manure to humans when we're using it in vegetable gardens and things like that. So we're working with them too. And, and another thing is they're on a um, earthen pad. And this is, we see this on farms all the time when they're scraping up their manure or turning the piles, they're incorporating soil into the piles. And what that does is it quickly increases the bulk density and makes that pile less porous so that the bugs are not getting enough oxygen. So um, with them, they're starting some trials on trying um, windrows instead of like putting it on this, on this big face. 
We know that they have the feedstocks that can make it work. They could get the temperatures right. But also in the long run, they are hoping to build an imperial, impermeable surface so they won't be incorporating as much soil into the compost. Um, <clears throat> this, I, I should check on time. So Natasha, what, um, what time did I start at about five after? Yeah, so you've got okay. 10, 10, 12 minutes. Okay, so this one um, is a diversified operation. Um, they raise vegetables. They have a lot of different animals. They've got chickens, they've got beef, they've got pigs, they've got sheep. Um, and they, they actually have um, a, a small food scraps collection system, mostly I think for their uh, customers, but maybe some more too. And they've got some um, coffee grounds that they get from place and there's some spent silage um, that they have that they feed um, to the animals, but some of which they, they don't use. And it's essentially a feedstock, potential feedstock for the compost. And what we found here is, um, again, this is really typical, but this is uh, more extreme here than on other farms. They got so much soil in the manure when they were collecting it that these compost piles had a bulk density that was close to water. It was about 1,600 pounds per cubic yard. And what would you really want to be somewhere between 800 to 1,000 pounds per cubic yard. Essentially, again, when you get that high, even if you have small windrows like this, you're not going to get air penetrating into the center and those microbes are not going to be active in there. They don't have the, the oxygen they need to mic drive that microbial oxidation process. So <clears throat> we ended up experimenting. It, so their piles were essentially cold. Um, we've done some, the farmer is very, um, really excited about composting. Um, and we've done a, a few trials, trial piles essentially to see if we could get that material to heat up and also um, to have her make a little bit of an effort, although it's impossible to do entirely to collect the manure without collecting a lot of soil with it. We've had a lot of success with some, with these trial piles and getting them to heat up. But the other thing is she also was, um, has gotten funding and started the um, construction on a bedded pack for her animals. In that case, they won't, the final um, bedded manure, they won't have um, earth in it. It's going to make a big difference there. This is um, on the, this farm was kind of on the far extreme of composting operations. They have a very successful composting business. They sell in bulk. Um, they sell in bags. It's a, it's a dairy, um, not as big. Uh, well, it's the next one, I guess, some work. I think these, the dairy, um, I forget, I think that they maybe have a, a hundred, maybe 150 milkers, um, but they've got um, uh, manure and leaf and yard waste composting operations that's been going on for a long time. They've developed a huge market. They deliver it themselves. Um, and so in the, this is a, it, it's an exciting one. It's hard to know exactly how to improve it in some ways. Um, the one thing that we found was they're not, they have a lot of space, um, but it's taking up, the, the operation is taking up more space than it needs to, and that space could be space that they could be using for um, farming. Um, because they're essentially, they've got a great mix of ingredients and they're just letting them sit in windrows for long periods of time. They're not monitoring the temperature and turning the piles um, in accordance with what they see in terms of the temperature. So. While they're making good piles, it's taking a longer time than it should, and that means it's taking up a little bit more space than it should. So what we're working on with them is just a, a monitoring, essentially a temperature monitoring program um, to get them to turn the piles a little bit more efficiently so that they can um, speed up the process and take a little less space on the, on the area. And then this one, I think I'd consider the biggest success story even though they've all been successful in certain ways. Um, this is a 400 cow dairy, conventional dairy in Connecticut. And they have, can you all see my pointer? 
Um, this is where they were, they were, they had, they were successfully composting their mortalities, which again, you know, the bigger the farm you are, the more mortality you're going to have. Um, but it was a, it was a big pile that was getting bigger. You can see a, the runoff from this pile was actually killing some of the trees around there because it was nutrient rich. Um, and it wasn't working that efficiently. They were getting pretty good temperatures, but it was taking a long time to get to the point where they could actually use that com screen and use that compost. Um, so, oh, and I didn't mention we had, we have working with us on this project, Bill Seekins, Dr. Bill Seekins, who is, well, he used to be an instructor um, at the U, uh, University of Maine composting school. And he, when we went, we, so he went to all the farms with us and quickly he, he could see that if they added a little bit more silage to this mix, they were going to get much better temperatures. And the son-in-law at this farm, um, was really excited about composting and took this to heart. And so they, they went into a different location because the location wasn't good. Um, again, you were getting runoff here and it was going down into a lower lying area. They changed the location a couple times. This is the, the first change, but right off the bat, they started to get great temperatures and they started to get decomposition of the bodies really quickly. Um, and then, um, and then they found, um, that you know they had sold some of the material to a com to um i think a local contractor but once they started getting a little bit more serious about it and making more um they got a lot of interest and started selling a lot more compost and now they're composting not just their mortalities but some of the bedded manure as well um, and they just keep on increasing um, the volume and the sales and they've moved now to an area where they have a flatter pad for turning the windrows um, so they've been, it's been great for them. They've been really excited about it and it actually has turned into an extra source of income for the farm. <clears throat> so um, these are general findings. We are gonna be writing up a report for this. I, I imagine it'll be public information because it's for the um, federal government. Um, the first thing is, is it's really important and I, and Natasha and I have talked about this a lot. Um, is what are you, the goals of composting? Because not everyone's out to make um, material that can, they can bag and then sell at Walmart. In some cases, it's really just material management. And maybe sometimes you don't need to compost. Maybe you'd be better off not composting, but it's really important to define those things up front. The other thing is there are a lot of simple things you can do at a site without going to a lab that can help you um, that are really simple measurements um, determine on the spot, like, yeah, this is good, this isn't good. I, the first one is density. We've gotten to the point where we always go around with a, a bucket that has um, gallons measured on it and a field scale and measure the, the bulk density of the compost because it's so often the case that these on-farm composting operations are out of an ideal range and sometimes really far out. So they're really not, if it's too, the bulk density is too high, they're really not gonna get much microbial activity. Um, and also the squeeze test, um, trying to uh, check the moisture with just a simple squeeze test can be really helpful um, and almost as good as what you get at a, a lab, sometimes even a little better because the, the lab test can, doesn't take into account some of the physical properties of that material. Um, the other thing is I do feel like composts are under-analyzed. The, the analysis, like feedstock analysis for compost is pretty inexpensive, um, especially for some of those bigger operations. The feedstock uh, analysis itself is usually only around $60. You complete like finished compost analysis is typically only about $100, $125 if you're not going for pathogens and metals. Um, <clears throat> and for composting operations that are not aerated static pile, temperature monitoring should be a guidance, I believe, for when you're turning those piles as opposed to saying, well, I, I do it once a month or once every two months or once a week. But you really need to look at the temperatures and they will tell you when it's time to turn the pile. And then the area, the, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, this, the idea of um, trial and error is really important because there's, you know, there are textbooks on how things should go when you're composting. 
there's no operation out there that's a textbook example. So you might be doing something that someone reading a textbook would say, this is crazy, you can't really compost that material, when in reality you can, and sometimes vice versa. So that, that it's really important to be interested and to be willing to try things out. Um, and I do think, well, you know, one of the things that we found is, um, I don't think it's, you know, necessarily some big disease outbreak coming anytime soon, but I do think it's really important to uh, monitor te temperatures when you're selling this into a market that might go into gardens or vegetable operations to ensure that you are getting good pathogen reduction. Um, and yeah, I do have two more slides. Um, this is something that we've been giving to this just made up numbers that I've been giving to far the farms that we're working with just to give them an idea of like, this is, this might be what you see. And this can, this is temperature monitoring at um, three feet into the pile, one feet into the pile. Um, and typically you're going to see if, if you have a good pile, a good bulk density, good moisture content, good seed end ratio, you're going to see those pile of temperatures go up pretty quickly. But what happens in a, in a windrow is um, a, a non-aerated static pile. Um, after a while, those bugs have done a lot of work and they've used up a lot of the oxygen that's in there and they lose some of that oxygen and then the temperature is going to go down again. And that's your indication that, okay, I want to incorporate some air into the pile. I want to turn those piles. It goes up again. And so something like this, I feel like is a better guide to when you should turn your piles than simply I'm going to do it every week or every month. And finally, I got uh, this basically just reiterating what I said before. Um, the theory of composting will only get you so far. And I think all of those of us that have worked with a lot of compost facilities have seen things that look like they should be perfect, but aren't working and just the opposite things that fall out of completely out of the range, moisture content, uh, C to N ratio that are still working well. And you really need to be curious and willing um, to do, to make trial piles, to try new amendments potentially. And my recommendation when doing it is make big changes. Don't make small little tweaks. Make the big changes so you can see like, yes, this is obviously a parameter that needs to be changed. Um, and that's, yeah, that's basically it. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, Athena, I don't know if you want to take over questions and I'll get my... Yeah, um, we, we have a comment, which I'm going to turn into a question, and it's, on, it's from Composter Carey, and it's um, his comment is, reducing hummus to stable organic carbon seems extremely reductionist, losing the sense of complexity. So I'm hoping, Andrew, you can... Elaborate. That is such a great question, and it could take a long time to answer. But this is this is this is a paradigm shift in soil chemistry that's happened over the past decade. We used to think of uh, soil humus as a combination of humic acids, sulfuric acids, and humans. Um, it turns out that those don't don't those don't exist. Those were artifacts of laboratory. Um, the, the laboratory methods were, that were being used at the time to try and describe these things that were sort of indescribable. And the, so the reason it's changed, I mean, it, it doesn't really change your explanation much, and you could still call that old resistant recalcitrant uh, soil carbon in soil as, as humus, but it's just not what we've thought of before. It te it, it, what the new paradigm, and I'm not saying it's correct, there's still a lot of uh, debate about it, but it's starting to get more generally accepted is that it's the, 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 the form hasn't changed that much. It's that stuff that's resistant to microbial um, oxidation or decomposition or uh, transformations that is what sticks around. It's not that we've created fulvic acids and humic acids. So that's, that's what it is. I, you know, in a, in a, maybe in a, presentation like this, it's, it's almost not worth it. I, when I first heard about it, I was shocked and, and uh, I wouldn't say angry, but reactive. Um, but I realized that it actually doesn't change what we're talking about that much. Essentially, 
is stable organic carbon or humus. It's, 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 it, it describes the same thing. It describes that long-term pool of organic matter that makes the soils dark, provides water holding capacity, erosion resistance, and that kind of thing. Can, can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Do, do you have time? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, Andrew. So hey. I guess, you know, I'm sure you, like I, like you, learned about humus as this organo-mineral complex, right? Yeah. It's yeah. not just organic matter, but it, it's, it's there's a mineral soil component of that. And that's what I feel like is lost. So yeah. uh, wh where are those, where is that now? Yeah, so that's a good question, and it, it, it's the case that that stable carbon is exactly that. It's an organo-mineral complex. It's just the, the carbon portion of that that's sort of being described differently, or at least that's my understanding. And maybe there's a better term than uh, stable organic, stable carbon, I don't know. I guess it really was the carbon, yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah, Thanks, right. uh, and I will yep. go back on mute. Okay. Yeah, that helped, Andrew. Um, and I have a quick question is, is uh, Collins Compost, are they in Connecticut? They are, yeah. Collins Powder That's Hill cool. Um, yeah. I started out with them, uh, getting them to compost like in 2010 on a manure management project I did. Oh, well, you've been successful. Yeah, yeah that's got, awesome. They've got a really thriving program. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Thanks. Um, anything else? I just figured I'd go ahead and get my screen up. You can see. No, that, that was it. So come up with questions for the after Natasha, everybody. All right. And you can see my screen. Thank okay. You. Yep. Great. Um, well, uh, so we're shifting to a project of the Composting Association of Vermont. And um, instead of just uh, introducing myself, because most of you know me or know a little bit about me um, by this point in the summit, if you didn't know me before, I thought I'd share uh, maybe a few things that you don't necessarily know about me. Um, and so I have been the director of the Composting Association of Vermont for just over seven years. Before that, I was the director of an international nonprofit called the International Society for Ethnobiology. So essentially, look, we worked in, had members in over 80 countries around the world working with indigenous and local communities really digging into and thinking about how all of the traditional knowledge wrapped up around how people think about, utilize, and manage natural resources. So ethnobiology is this umbrella that some of you may be familiar with, ethnobotany or ethnomedicine. Um, so it's all of that. Um, and I also, um, I, I sort of, the, my first experiences with on-farm composting was actually back when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal, West Africa, and we did field trials. And um, previous to my composting work there, they were burning fields. So we bit manures, field refuse. And so we dug pits um, because it was very dry there and we scraped everything into them and being young and hopeful and naive I was like I hope this works because you know this was my first kind of in the field experience and um, just be based on the resources and the climate we put it all in manures and field residues and they'd have a ceremony where they'd pour basically a shot glass of um of urea into it <laughs> as a as a blessing and we'd bury it and we'd dig it up in a year and um and then very cautiously my my uh farm farmer partners gave me the worst parts of their fields to try this on and within the first season those those poorest performing sections of their fields outperformed what had been their best fields. And so thankfully other farmers came and it spread and, and I had the opportunity to go back and visit and more and more people are, are doing this type of on-farm field composting. Um, and we also use some of the finished compost to do land reclamation um, from land that had been rendered unarable due to termite mounds. And so it was just hard pan. And so we just, during the, the rainy season scratch scratch what we could and pile compost on it and actually were able to reclaim some of that that land for farmland as well. Um, so there's a little bit of my background that maybe some of you didn't didn't know about just just for fun. Um, today I'm going to be talking about 
on-farm community-oriented food scrap composting in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Um, and so, so this is, again, you're going to hear some of the same themes that you heard from Andrew, but it's quite different in many respects. And it's also um, looks explicitly looking to fold in food scrap diversion and food scrap composting into on-farm composting systems. So this work was funded by the is being funded currently by USDA Rural Utility Services Solid Waste Management Program. So big thanks to them for uh, for funding this work. And we started back in 2021, um, focused on partner working with partner farms in Vermont and New Hampshire. They're one year grants, but in both of these cases, we did the one year no cost extension. And then we followed up that first round of funding. Um, we were lucky enough to receive a second round of funding to not only add in some partner sites in upstate New York, um, but also to focus on developing a community of practice to support this work among farmers and community members, but also among technical service providers. And that's been one of the challenges that we've been facing is like, who are the people supporting farms in this, in this arena? I just wanna uh, give a shout out to tra trainers and my project steering committee. Um, in the, the, for the first grant, it was really Athena Lee Bradley, um, who's an organic management consultant, Kat Buxton of Grow More Waste Less and myself. Um, with the second round of funding where we've continued working with our original farmers and have added more farmers, capacity always being high on my mind, human capacity to, to support this work, but also wanting to bring more people into this work um, and, and have it be more of a community of practice. Allie Baker from Fruit to Root, who's on, um, and Jen Perry, I believe, is also on. Um, Jen Perry from Compost for Good, Adirondack North Country Association um, is sort of our New York partner in this. And, uh, and then I am a big fan of project steering committees. It really allows us to, to have an expanded knowledge base to bring in a variety of perspectives and, and expertise and experiences. And while this has changed over the three-ish years that we've been doing this work, these, this is just a list of our current steering committee members. So I'm gonna be talking about like how we approach this work and the process more than, um, so it's gonna be a little bit different format than what Andrew presented on um, sort of going through like the, what we found and what we did. Um, I'm gonna focus more on how we approach this work, some of the tools that we've developed to support this work and then also give you a snapshot of some of our partner farmers. So the project goal um, for both grants um, and of this work overall for the Composting Association of Vermont is really to develop sustainable community-oriented composting sites with, partner, with farmer partners to manage food scraps, farm residues, manures, and other organics. So I wanna dig into that just a little bit. So first, what is community-oriented on-farm composting? Um, I started using, when we first started this work, it sort of grew out of community composting and working with groups that were collectively composting together on a site. That is the case with some of our partner farmers, as you'll hear in a little bit, but I really switched to this concept of community-oriented because it is, uh, connecting farmers looking to compost with community members looking to divert food scraps from landfills, but they're not necessarily inviting community members onto their farms to engage in that community and in, in that composting process. In some cases that does happen. They may have volunteers. Some farms have staff. Other farms are collectives or, um, or nonprofits and have more community engagement. But it's really this community oriented piece that I'm distinguishing a little bit here. So I just wanted to, to help folks understand how we're using those terms. In terms of what we mean by sustainable success, um, I think of it in, um, and this program thinks of it sort of in the three different groups that are engaged in it. So 
for organizations like the Composting Association of Vermont. We're hoping and we think of sustainable success as projects that continue to thrive after we step away. So not being the ones that are doing the work that are propping it all up and, um, and then things kind of disintegrate as we move on or if our funding status changes. For farmers, what, I, what I've been hearing from a lot of our partners and what I think is true sort of broadly is to have effective organic management that fits within their farming practices. As Andrew said, there are some, there are some farmers who are composting and it is um, a value added product. They're doing it for a variety of reasons, but a lot of farmers, like there's clearly organic management or organic materials to manage. Um, and there's definitely increased interest from community members in, especially in rural areas, in diverting food scraps and, and other organic materials to farms. But that's not necessarily their main gig, right? They're growing food, they're raising animals, they're doing all this other stuff. There's a seasonality to it. And so it's really important. And this is one of the things that we talk with our partner farmers a lot about is how do we help them set up systems physically, as well as the man types of system choices and the management practices. So it fits within what they're doing within their larger farming enterprise. And if, if those two don't dovetail, it's, it often falls by the wayside because lambing season comes and guess what? That takes precedence, right? So there's other things that will compete for farmers' time and resources. And for communities, they really want food scrap diversion, right? They're, that's they're looking to, um, especially with a lot of new laws. There's, a, you know, depending on where folks are, there may not be root density for hauling. There might not be municipal or commercial compost avail operations available or facilities available. So, how do they also become better stewards and and think about better management for the food scraps that they're producing? Um, and so underpinning all of this in for, for the work that we do is having this work be farmer oriented. If the farmer is going to be the primary composter and steward of these organic materials, it requires relationship building and establishing supportive systems that enable farmers to add just one more layer of all the community service they are already providing to their communities. So again, um, I'll get into this a little bit more, um, but this has actually been a little bit of a, of a friction point with some organizations that are looking to support community-oriented food scrap diversion, I'll call it, focus more on diversion, or with community groups who are like, you know, there's a farm down the road. Why don't they want our stuff, right? Why won't they just become a food scrap composter? Um, it really needs to be focused on providing the support that the farmers need to do this well and to have it feel comfortable and to provide them not only the technical skills, but, but um, the relationship skills to have confidence in doing that. And the other thing that I wanna just really highlight is that in the work that we do, farmers decide how to define community. So when a farmer agrees to partner with us and explore this type of composting system, they are not sh hanging out a shingle saying, everybody in my town, everybody in my county, come dump your food scraps here. Often, especially with the, the farmers that we've been partnering with, are new composters. They've never really, I mean, they may have had a rot pile, but they've never really actively composted. And so, you know, many of them start small with just a, even maybe a subset of their CSA members, their community supported ag members. They may start by just taking food scraps from their the farmer's market that they go to once a week and bringing it back and integrating it. And what we've seen is as they start these systems small and gain confidence, their systems become more efficient, it feels more accessible, they often decide and feel comfortable to expand. But often one of the, one of the hitches that farmers come across and that one of the obstacles that may keep them from even engaging in this space is feeling like community, everybody in my town, I have to, how much is that? Oh my goodness, All right, it's overwhelming. And so really making the entry into this work feel accessible. 
And so this is just shows sort of how I see the supporting organizations, the interested farmers and community members, supporting organizations need to really support on both the, the community side and the farmer side. And then where those interested farmers and community members intersect is the community oriented on farm composting that we're talking about here. So um, I'm gonna go look at each of those groups uh, sort of one by one and think about ways that we can make this work sustainable and also um, start tying in some of the approaches that we use. Um, so I've already talked about steering committee and team. For me, that's super important. We actually double up our technical service providers where we can for farmers. So farmers meet at least two of us, often more than two of us. What that allows us to do is be people also <laughs> and go on vacation or get sick or have other priorities so we can tag team. Um, it, it allows us to provide much more fluid um, support for the, our partners in this work. I think it's also really important to really recognize the time that it takes to build trusted relationships and to build that into a project. And thankfully with the USDA grants that we've had with their option for no cost one year extensions, we've utilized that. And we've needed that extra time because life also happens for farmers, right? So part of this is seeing farmers as whole people with all kinds of moving parts within their families, within their lives, within their communities and on their farms for sure. I'm a huge fan of informational interviewing techniques um, as a way for understanding motivation and why farmers might be getting into this. Um, that's really just a fancy way of saying, be curious. You heard Andrew say that as well. Like instead of coming in with assumptions or ideas of how things should be done or could be done on a farm, we start by under trying to understand um, the why a farmer is interested in it, what their goals are, are they looking to just manage the organic material that they have? And maybe it makes sense if they do need, you know, if it's bedded pack and additional nitrogen sources is helpful. Food scraps are great for that. Um, is it a nonprofit with an educational component? It, you know, there's all these different reasons for wanting to offer another um, value added service to their, their farm customers. There's all different reasons for farmers to get into this, um, into this work, into composting, and really understanding what that is from the beginning helps us support them better in achieving their goals. But it also gives us clues through these conversations of what are some of the, the concerns that might be coming up for farmers? What are some of their hesitations? And, uh, and helping work around those as opposed to having them remain obstacles. And that leads into what I call understanding the readiness gap. And basically that's just um, sort of my shorthand for, you know, we'll, when we start a project, we get a lot of farmers who are like, oh yeah, this sounds great. I think this would be good to do. And then when you actually take that to the next level of conversation, they're interested, but they may not quite be ready to commit to it or to put the time and resources to it. Um, and sometimes though the, the hesitancy can be addressed and extinguished essentially, and, and a, a pathway forward can open up for them um, as a partner and in getting into community oriented composting. And other times it's really just not the right time. And that also needs to be okay, right? So. This is not work for every farmer everywhere, and and it needs to um, that needs to be respected. If that timing isn't right, or if once they learn more about the process, it's just not something where they want to put their energy. Um, and all of these all of these pieces lead to, I think, an increased sense of ownership and control over the activities, and that is the foundation for it for the continuing success. From a farmer's point of view, they often need technical support for composting. I hear from a lot of people this sort of pervasive assumption that farmers just know how to compost because of course farmers compost. That is really not true. 
And if they do know how to compost or if they have started composting, often they're there's a lot of uncertainty that they feel and anxiety around it. Um, and often, as we saw from Andrew's presentation, there are things that really could be done better um, or to make it more efficient, to make it a better process and an easier process for them to manage. So technical support for composting, but also for using the compost. That's another assumption that I, I hear a lot is that farmer, of course, farmers know how to use compost and to get the most out of it. That's really not true. And so we've done a lot of work on soil tests, compost tests. How do you use it? When do you use it? You know, phosphorus issues, nitrogen availability, all of this needs to be part of making this successful, uh, uh, successful and sustainable in the long run. Um, and then, when we fold in this community oriented aspect, we've developed a lot of support and a lot of outreach and education specifically targeted to communities, helping them understand how to be effective partners to their farm. Um, and then funding is always an issue with the, for, for new, you know, there's often in some, even if it's small infrastructure um, costs, and then um, a need for ongoing support. And again, that's, you know, we work intensely, you know, the technical support might be intense at the beginning, but we still get calls like, hey, Natasha, I just switched this up or I got this new feed source of feedstock. How, and then my, you know, so my recipe changed and it's not heating up anymore. So like, how do you continue to walk with them um, down, down that path so they can continue evolving and iterating? And then for communities, um, a reliable means for diverting food scraps is what a lot of community groups want. Um, but again, I'm gonna just come back to understanding how to be good partners to their partners through their farmer composters. So understanding what a farmer accepts and why is very important. And also understanding um, contamination prevention. Um, and I think this group knows what that is, but again, just the fact that this is relationship based. And so if they know the farmer where the food scraps are going, it tends to be pretty clean streams, but we also need communication systems because education around this is iterative. And the other thing that um, I talk with a lot of community groups about is the potential need for multiple farmer partners. So um, you know, it may be that a, a, a large zero waste group wants to find a farm to take all of the waste for all of the people in that area. That may or may not be realistic. And so understanding from a community perspective, they may need to be cultivating, developing and supporting relationships with multiple farmer partners to meet their diversion goals. So again, coming back to this farmer oriented approach. Um, I feel like I'm, how am I doing on time? Athena, feel free to flag me if I need to go faster. Um, so just a little glimpse into the process that we've established. Um, we start with partner agreements that clearly outline what, what we are committing to in terms of the support we're providing um, and what our expectations are. And so that's just upfront clear and transparent. We have a farmer assessment that we utilize as a tool. It helps us collect the information and have documented what they're already doing, if they're already composting or not, all of the stuff. But as we work through this document together, it's the underpinnings of the, the conversation with them and relationship building um, with them and things come up in conversation that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, and then we do ask about compost confidence on a scale of one to five. And with our first cohort, all but one of our seven partners were between one and two. So we we're talking about really new composters who did not have a lot of experience with this process. We also ask questions about perceived obstacles and concerns. And these range from confusion around regulations, concerns about contamination, knowledge, time, um, in some cases, whether their community would be interested at all. And again, this, how do you use the product? So they're not just making compost to compost, but it's actually gonna be useful. 
Um, we do site visits for uh, technical support and community engagement. We provide ongoing support via phone, text, email, and shared files. Um, we often ask in that assessment, how do people, like what is the communication path that works for people? It's not always the same. We have some farmers who really text and they don't do email at all. Um, most of our farmers have been, you know, are familiar and comfortable with shared files. And we recommend that um, for a lot of things. It's a great way to share resources with them um, and have them be able to find them. But we have some farmers who do all of their monitoring in like Google Sheet logs or Google um, document logs. And so when they text me and say, you know, my pile's not heating up, I can look at it at what they're adding in real time and what their temperatures have been and when they've turned and other th management things and then provide pointers in that. So again, it's just a communication tool. And then as part of this, we do also um, offer stipends, um, somewhat small stipends, but still stipends that offset infrastructure costs. And so for new partners, that's $2,000. And then for our ongoing partners, we built in a $500 um, $500 stipend. And so that is for thermometers or buckets for their community members or whatever it is. Um, and this is what it looks like. And this picture makes me so happy. I love this. And so we're, we do community events. We walk farms and look at different sites. We, you know, get our hands dirty and do all of the things that you heard from Andrew in terms of on-site uh, looking uh, this is John Culpepper, who's uh, part of Compost for Good and Jen, and at an open house on a farm, they did a microscopy thing. And so this is our farmer, Cherie, learning how and looking at, at, um, at compost under a microscope. And this is Allie, my other newest newish uh, technical service provider and a project that she did. So whatever it is, we're, we're there and we're present and we're engaging and building relationships. Um, and these are our first cohorts of farmers. Um, I can just briefly tell you, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time, but uh, there are, I'm gonna provide links to some previous webinars that we did at VORS that highlighted the farmers where the, you could hear from them. And we also have some videos that I'll point you to, but um, our first cohort of farms, um, a Scutney is, is on about three and a half acres and they're human powered mixed veggie. So the the operators, Lauren and Oliver, like you really, if you're committed to doing everything by hand, your systems and your process decisions are different than if you have a tractor, right? If you're going to use a tractor or if you have a team. And so these are the places that we, um, we engage in. Firefly Farm is one and a half acres, true hillside farming, um, and they do mixed vegetables, nuts, fruits, herbs, flowers, and have a small flock of, flock of laying hens. High Water Farm is a small queer owned and operated family farm growing diversified veggies and berries on half an acre of owned and leased land. And so that also gives us an opportunity to see the landowners that they lease from as another stakeholder and partner in this. Open Woods Farm is a veggie farm on the side of a hill literally in the middle of the forest in New Hampshire. And uh, Sayer Palmer specializes in salad greens, summer high tunnel crops, winter growing, and picking rocks, she says, because that's a constant thing at her farm. Susu Community Farm is a nonprofit Afro-Indigenous stewarded farm and land-based healing center on 37 acres. They're one of our partners where a lot of those um, community composting. So composting as a group and as a community, a lot of those tools and resources come into play in different ways than with some of our other partner farms because they have multiple stewards. Although Keegan Ruffello is the, the, comp, the, the compost steward, he's got a whole team of folks that he needs to coordinate and communicate with. Sweet Beet Farm is part of the Kearsage Food Hub, which is a nonprofit that also includes a market and cafe. Um, Pierre Hahn is the lead farmer there on one and a half acres and they're certified organic veggie herbs and flowers and they do a lot of microgreens as well. And then um, Worksong Farm is operated by Dan and Abby Kilrain. It's a three acre farm that produces diverse veggies, herbs and flowers. And so 
just wanted you to see um, some of some of our, our original partners um, from the first grant and their community engagement um, is is listed here. So they uh, many of them started with just CSA members, farmers markets, um, pickups just either from the whole market or just from their stall. Two are working with schools. Some of them have wholesale customers as well that they're collecting from. Um, High Water Farm partners with a brewery and takes their spent grain. There's partnerships with food shelves. Many of our, our partner farmers have on-farm community meals or events. Sweet Beat partners with its, um, with the, within its food hub of the cafe and market. And then of course, neighbors and friends. Um, and this is what they look like. I just wanted you to see the different scales, right? So we've got uh, Jora tumblers and bin combinations. We have an aerated bin system here. We have the traditional three bin system. And this is at Susu Community Farm where they've figured out how to empty their Jora tumbler into their tractors for easier um, movement of materials. At Sweet Beet, they do this really, I call these compost loaves because that's what they look like to me, but it's a, a aerated static um, pile essentially. And then um, Sayer at Open Woods has a aeration, a, a forced aeration system that's solar powered. Um, and then uh, Work Song does field windrows. So collectively, um, they in the the first for the first grant, they uh, they composted 153 tons of food scraps and crop residues, 48 tons of manure with bedding, 33 tons of other mixed carbon sources like leaves, hay, wood shavings, wood chip, and produced over 10 tons of finished compost, and that's the um, over 200,000 net pounds of of CO2 saved, and so. Small but mighty. These are just seven little farms who are learning what to do, and many of them are um, are have plans to expand and are evolving their systems. But again, I would argue for not only rural areas but also in some urban areas. This can, you know, collectively with a whole network and community of practice around uh, you know, engagement around this type of work can have a real meaningful impact on, um, on food scrap diversion and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions saved. This is our second cohort of farms. Um, there's some other content I wanna be sure to get to, so I'm not gonna read about them, but Flying Dog Farm, Green Mountain Girls, The Soul Connection Farm, Huckins, The Cook Farm, and Witten Family Farm. Um, and we're moving into some bedded pack, still some diversified, more animals in this um, in this cohort than um, in the other ones. Huffins Farm is a dairy, um, and the Soul Connection Farm grows mushrooms, herbs, and and mixed leafy greens. Um, and so it's a huge variety. So we're also looking to have different scales and different types of farming models that. Um, so, so we can really show through this work that there is a system that can suit all different types of <clears throat> and all the diversity that farms show up. Um, we offer compost tea talks. Um, we'll be starting these again in May, although maybe rebranding. This was our clever that we thought I thought it was a clever idea for uh, <laughs> our take on um on like the lunch and learn kind of webinars, um, but there's a lot of confusion around compost tea. And so um, we're gonna likely be rebranding that, but we'll be starting this online free and open um, learning series this summer. And if someone is, I'm just gonna go ahead and mute whoever's that is. Um, and, um, and so I wanna, all of this is built into this on-farm composting toolkit that I'm going to now switch over and actually put up on the screen and show you guys um, with a bunch of resources for farmers, communities, and organizations. Um, and I will, uh, these are just quickly the links to, um, which I'll provide in um, with the recording 
to the other webinars that we've done for previous summits around this project. All right, and so this is the on-farm composting toolkit. Can you all guys all see that all right? And so um, it is, we just, Allie Baker, shout out. She came on, um, what, last August maybe and has really helped me revamp and reorganize this. Um, this on the homepage, this is actually like an eight minute video of the first cohort of farmers talking about why they wanted to engage in this, this work and, and the value that it has to them as farmers and community members. Um, the communities page, uh, I'll get to the farmers resources last, I think is just a single page, but you can see that um, there's all kinds of, you know, we talk about things to think about, how to develop a diversion program, how to build towards a plan, how to be, you know, what are the roles of farmers and how do you effectively work with farmers, how to set goals, all of that is there. Um, for the organizations, it's, it's, whoops, for organizations, it's, it's somewhat similar, but a little bit different thinking about the roles that organizations like CAV plays, where we're trying to support community groups and farmers coming together, but with the idea that at some point we're going to step back. And then um, the farmers resources um, is really, you know, this is the landing page and it talks about the sort of before you begin, we go over regulations and community questions and all of that, but I want to come down here. We now have these five learning modules. So things to think about and tools to support your first year that covers everything from where do you put your compost system? How do you choose a compost system? What is a recipe? Um, year two and beyond really gets into sort of evolving and okay, now you're doing well, but you wanna make some changes. How do or you wanna expand? What does that look like? Troubleshooting tips, um, advanced topics and the learning forum. Um, Troubleshooting tips is like your basic tips and tricks, but also a focus on winter composting, which is of course important in, up here in New England. And um, there's just a couple advanced topics like compost aeration, heat recovery, and a few and microscopy now, but the advanced topics and learning forum are things that will be growing and that we'll be focusing on in some of the upcoming TTOP learning series. Um, and so this is at onfarmcomposting.org. And I would just invite you all to take a look. And, um, and there it is on uh, onfarmcomposting.org. And um, peruse it, ask questions, share. And um, yeah, and I, that's all I wanted to, to, well, there's so much more I could say, but that's the end of my presentation for today. And so, oof, with 13 minutes left, 10, 15 minutes left for questions. We'll just open it up and Athena is going to be uh, managing that. Um, we answered a couple of questions okay. in the chat. We did have a question on, um, which would be great for you to answer, Natasha. Mm -hmm. Can you make any observations about the types of farmers who are interested and or successful? Yeah, so a lot of the farmers, and I do recommend listening to that little eight minute video, I almost put it into my presentation, but decided just providing the link to it would would make more sense. But many of the people, many of our farmer partners who are engaged have a real sense of community commitment and engagement already. They are already community hubs in many ways. Many of them talk about um, like Sayer Palmer, for instance, at, at Open Woods Farm in New Hampshire talks about like, this is an area where she can help her community feel empowered. She can help educate them about why diversion, connections with, with a changing climate, um, local, the importance of local management. A lot of our farmers also um, really are strongly attached and believe in a really tight, decentralized, um, new closed nutrient loop. And so they do a lot of outreach with their community. And again, not their whole town or county necessarily, but with the community that is often actually growing for, for many of them around, you know, we're, we're stewarding the land, we're growing food, we're feeding you, bring those scraps that you don't feed back to us so we can make it into compost, put it back in our very fields and grow more food. 
And so there's a lot around that. We've heard from a handful of our farmer partners that actually when they started, people started hearing in the community that they were accepting food scraps. They got new CSA members in part driven by the fact that they wanted a farm to partner with to bring their scraps to. And so it's these kinds of relationships. And there's a whole section um, of the toolkit where we talk about a, a bit about the difference between relationship and relational food scrap diversion and contractual. And that's not to say that there isn't a place for contracts. There are like at joining a CSA, you could think of that as there's a contract exchange happening. But when people know where their food scrap it's food scraps are going and how it's being managed, it tends to be cleaner. There tends to be much more in community and true engagement than if you just bring it in a tote down to the bottom of your drive and you don't even actually know where it goes. So someone comes and it just gets taken away. And so that's some of the differentiations that we've been been drawing on. Yeah, and just to add, we've only lost two um, people who started in the program, two farmers who started in the program. One was very early on, so had just started their assessment. And the other was like six months in, Natasha. Yeah. And they had like family issues and just were overwhelmed with kind of everything. So it wasn't really our project. But um, so we had a couple of nice comments from folks and then a question about if we're uh, considering expanding to other states, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Yeah, so I would love to do that, and um, but but I don't know that it makes sense for CAV to do that. So as the Composting Association of Vermont, we are committed to working with our our, our neighboring states. But part of the idea behind the the free lunch and learns, and we actually have a list of about forty farmers throughout um, primarily New England, but also Georgia and Florida now. Who get a who sign up? You can sign up on the toolkit to get announcements when we're doing these. It's also just posted online, but if you don't look, you'll get an email. Um, and so that is one mechanism to get more people engaged. And then the organization and the community sections of the toolkit are really intended to empower other people to pick this up and replicate some of the work. And um, and I do, um, you know, we do get calls and sort of one off you know, idea, brainstorming, generating um, plans. But um, but again, just coming back to the capacity and the, the mission really of the Composting Association of Vermont, stretching, but we like to have partners, like we're working with Compost for Good in New York is a great example. And there isn't an equivalent really in New Hampshire, but we have uh, pretty deep and, and longstanding connections with some of the regional planning commissions, as well as with New Hampshire DES um, staff, a couple staff there. And so we are working to grow local capacity within New Hampshire as well to take on some of the technical service. Um, and another question on uh, our farms, are any of the farms taking compostable products mm. and are they considering doing so? Yeah, that is uh, that is a whole huge conversation. Um, and I'd also be interested actually to hear if any of Andrews, it didn't sound like any of the farms that Andrew's working with are doing that. Some are interested in that. Um, many of our partner farms are not certified organic, but they are following organic production um, guidelines and best practices. And so until there are changes within the National Organics Program, NOP, those products are actually not permissible in compost for use in certified organic production. So that is one of the things. People are taking like clean paper plates, like paper, like 100% paper, um, as well as um, we had one farm that had an event and they sourced wood, like just completely bit wood uh, for flatware basically that was had no coatings on it that they did take um, and they chipped up. Um, but generally, no, there is interest among some of our farms, but there's also a bit of hesitation. And I, I get the sense that there's sort of waiting for things to settle out a little bit in this moment right now. Yeah, and Susu had an event and they did compost certified for compostable products. Um, and they're doing it separate from their food scraps and then they're adding the composted food scraps to that mix. 
And Heather, um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, great. Thank you, Heather Trim, uh, Zero Waste Washington out in Seattle. Thanks again for um, making this open to the whole U.S. Um, my question is actually for Andrew. Is that okay right now? Absolutely. Sure. Okay, great. So you brought up awful, and this is something that we are starting to struggle with here in Washington as well. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little more broadly about that topic. And do you have meat processors who are trying to get rid of bones and things, or is it primarily farmers? And generally, what are farmers across the region doing in that regard? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> we work... So most of the, the on-farm composting operations that we work with um, doing mortalities um, are doing whole animals. And generally when the composting is effective, um, the animal is pretty much gone except for some of the bigger bones like uh, hip bones, sometimes a skull and things like that. We also, so we do, um, in our work doing nutrient management planning for farms that are working with the NRCS, um, we've worked, we've started to work more with more and more with farms that have butcher shops as well. So we are um, helping some of them develop composting recipes and um, a little infrastructure on site for doing that. Um, and it's been, you know, to date, it's been very effective. It's messy um, and it does require a little more care um in terms of recipe development than most of the other on-farm composting operations that we work with because it um yeah i mean it, you you've got to have you've got to get your pile hot um relatively quickly in order to you know not get it anaerobic on the inside and also you know importantly not to um attract coyotes which is a big issue for us with any type of either mortality composting or awful from, from uh, butchers or slaughterhouses. And are but there yeah, any odor, we, odor issues? Same as, you know, from my perspective, it's the same as uh, any other composting. It can stink if, um, and, the, and the, it's a different quality of odor uh, from awful than say from food waste, but uh, just just to give you an example, I I um, I'm one of the composting operations I've been working with recently, not one of the on farm ones that um, dug into a pile that they thought was was basically finished. It was a food waste composting operation, and um, my my car was you know you you couldn't sit in it for a while afterwards. It it was really strong where there are you know awful composting operations that we've worked with. If I dug into the piles, I wouldn't get that same smell. The, they're not nearly as strong or offensive. Um, Bob Dylan wouldn't call it an odor most foul, but um, <laughs> it is, it, I think that it poorly managed, it can stink to high heaven, yes. And that's true with anything though, right? Like, just like Andrew said, Yeah. right? I mean, I could talk for a long time on odors. I, you know, different things have different odors and we respond psychologically very differently to them. And the ones that come from awful that's gotten too wet or have, is, is, you know, it's pretty foul. You really want to cover with carbon um, as soon as you get the material, if you're collecting from your butchering on farm and then make sure you use a lot of carbon in your composting and cover it immediately. Yeah, but I do think, I, and I don't know, Heather, if this is part of what you're asking, if it's sort of a, a best management practice for managing um, slaughterhouse or butcher waste, um, but it definitely can be um, if managed well. Well, I'm actually asking it from a policy perspective because we're going to probably incorporate something about it in our next organics bill next January. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'll follow up with you offline. Yeah. I remember when I lived in Seattle, they had a rendering facility and um, on the Duwamish just south of um, Seattle that always had um, a pretty strong odor. And I, you know, I still think it, it's like anything else though, that I work with in terms of organic waste. I, I don't think there's only one option. Um, and there may be some good uses for um, some of that waste that's other, other than composting, but if composting is, is a chosen option, I think it, it can be a great way to go. 
Yeah, We've I'd... collected a few um, resources, Heather. There aren't a lot out there, so we're happy to share the, what we have. Yeah, and I definitely would encourage you to at least include composting among approved, you know, like within the policy. The most important one, and, and Natasha alluded to this, that typically for on-farm composting operations, this is, it's, the composting is far from their first priority. Sometimes it's their fifth or sixth priority. I mean, there's some farms where they're two it might be number two or three, but that is one of our big lessons is in terms of making recommendations. You can see that things aren't working and you can see exactly how to make them better. But for that farm to actually make those changes, if it's their fifth priority, um, that's really tough sometimes. Yeah, that's why we like doing the assessment and we have a couple of meetings virtually with them and in, in the process of doing the assessment together with them. It helps everybody think about the goals and the process and outcomes. Um, I seem to be back. Sorry, can you guys hear me now? You are back, yes. Excellent, sorry about that. I don't have any more questions um, right. in if, the chat. If anybody are, wants to- I was out. gonna say, we're just at the hour, the, okay. the end of the session time as well. Um, We'll definitely be sure to include relevant links in the with the recording. Um, and I'm sure Andrew is open to having folks reach out directly to him as I'm I and my team. So if you do have any follow-up questions um, or, or want access to something sooner than later, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us. Andrew, thank you so much for co-presenting on on-farm composting with me. Really appreciate it. And um, to all of participants. Uh, for joining us again, and Athena for uh, moderating the Q&A. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you all so much. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you. All. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Guys.